Ladies and gentlemen, look who I have on my channel, Nadia Shah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vic. Thank you for this moment with you, for this moment with your audience, and just being really, really cool. I will say that you are a cool dude. So thank you so much for asking you're, me. You're uh, cool. You're cool. <laughs> we're going to have a fun time. We're going to have yeah. a cool time. We're going to talk about things and we're going to be relaxed. Relax. Yeah, we're totally going to relax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that because on the lead up to here, it was like, oh my God, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And yeah. uh, it was just like a lot of hustle bustle. But now I'm just like, okay, Nadia, be here. Be still. Uh, but not so still that we forget to enjoy life, right? Yeah, or but fall yeah. asleep. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want you to tell us what kind of astrology you do, if you could name it or describe it. Sure. I practice Western astrology. I think that's the simplest way to put it. I've studied a lot of different techniques in my journey uh, over the last, it's been a while actually. <laughs> it's been uh, about, Am I right? It's almost 30 years studying astrology. I mean, I was a child when I started studying astrology. And um, as part of that, I've been exposed to different techniques. I started getting more serious about astrology about 25 years ago or so. And so as part of getting more serious and, you know, you come across all kinds of knowledge of different, uh, different teachers, I've always sort of come back to the Western way of, of looking at things. I will... You know, I'll have clients sometimes and they'll ask me questions, especially if they're coming from an Eastern paradigm, right? Being that I'm South Asian, if I have a South Asian client, the culture sees astrology differently. They see it very faded. And so they'll ask me things like, when will I get married, right? To a Western astrologer, a Western astrologer is going to take that and say, well, when do you want to get married? And let's, you know, explore that part of the psychological experience. And I bring that into it as well. But if a client asks me a question, I want to honor their space. And I honor the fact that this is the tradition that we come from. Uh, for all the discussion lately about prediction and does it still have a role in astrology or does it have any role in astrology? This is our tradition, right? This is what the ancients did up until very recently in human history and still in the East, the astrologers are the priests. And as part of this, we've been intermediary of the gods and we have uh, spoken of what is to come. And so I honor that as well. And I'll incorporate those techniques. But for the most part, uh, I come very much from the Western tradition. Uh, when we go back in my ancestry and my lineage, I have a lot of uh, people who practiced various forms of esoteric art, but it was definitely the, the Western and the evolution of Western astrology that my ancestors were a part of. So it feels uh, very right for me to practice this form of astrology. Okay. I have a funny thing to say, and then I have yeah. a follow-up question. Isn't it yeah. funny that you're South Asian, but you're practicing Western astrology, but I'm Italian and I'm practicing Indian astrology? I think it's about whatever calls your soul, right? I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. And I think now we are older souls than ever before. I think that's part of why uh, the world has become so small, right? I mean, you think about how this, this idea of all of a sudden realizing that the earth was round and there was, you know, this whole wide world out there. That was a leap in consciousness for human beings uh, to realize there is an other. That was a huge leap of consciousness. And so... Now, as we're becoming more integrated and more understanding of our interconnection, I think it gives us a lot of freedom. Like more than ever, there are more souls now who identify more strongly with a land that is not of their ancestors. Mm. And so I'll give you an example. I, uh, I have a South Asian ancestry um, and I feel that within me. And there's been a lot of stories about that. And I've heard about these amazing people in my family going back many, many, many generations, but I've never actually been to South Asia. The first time in my life I even stepped on Asia was just 2015. It wasn't even that long ago. It was, uh, you know, when I actually stepped on, uh, stepped on Asian land. And so I identify so strongly as Canadian. Like that's how I see myself and mm. my values are very Canadian. At the same time, though, when I came to Mexico, I remember it was about six years ago at this time, I felt such a strong connection to the land and to the people. I didn't speak the language at all. 
but I just knew I had some powerful karmic connection here and that I had to be here. I had to learn the language. Uh, I had to understand this, this land and its people and its culture more deeply. And it's a journey that's, uh, you know, I'm still in. It's been six years in and I'm still mm. in the journey. Mm. And I think that a lot of times, like people don't realize that it's one thing to say, um, for example, we can say Vedic astrology. And yes, it comes from the Vedas. However, even Vedic astrology, it adapts to fit into different contexts. So for example, Vedic astrology, yes, it arises from a Hindu tradition. Like I said, the Vedas are Hindu texts. However, there are Islamic forms of Vedic astrology. There are Christian forms of Vedic astrology. I once went to see an astrologer who was an Islamic Vedic astrologer, and I've seen Hindu Vedic astrologers as well. And it was remarkably similar. It was remarkably similar, not just in terms of the prediction and the style, but also in terms of the prescriptions, right? In terms of wear this stone, say this prayer, put this prayer in your water and, and drink it. Uh, there were things like that. And ultimately, these are things that uh, on some level are about empowering us, whether we want to explore, is it psychological, is it energetic, whatever. And so I think even within each tradition, there is that sense. But what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, my ancestors were in large part Sufi. And the Sufi tradition arises from the Arab world. And it was during the Middle Ages when, uh, when Europe was sort of in the Dark Ages that it was uh, the uh, Arabs who about a thousand years ago, a little over about 1400 years ago, who sort of picked up on those uh, on that ancient wisdom, the Greek texts, and the astrological texts as well, like Ptolemy. And it was them who, in addition to translating those texts into Arab, which would in future be translated into Latin to re-enter the, the European world during the Renaissance, it was uh, at that time that we see the very beginning of putting astrology into a monotheistic context, first of all, and putting it into a psychological context. So this is where we look at an aspect that Ptolemy said, you know, if you have Mars uh, conjunct the midheaven and the sun squaring from this uh, part of the sky, this person will get a burn on their hand when they are uh, 12 years old. Like it's that specific, his uh, calculations. But it was those uh, in the Arab world that they started saying, if you have the sun square Mars, it could be that you have some issues with anger and you are going to learn to uh, channel that and it would be good to practice some patience. And it was also at this time that these, you know, these early Sufis and these mystics who I have this connection to, an ancestral connection to ultimately, who said that the chart is perfect, that everything that the chart is, is exactly what it needs to be so that you can do all it is that you're meant to do in this lifetime. And so um, a lot of times people think South Asian and right away they go to Eastern astrology, Vedic astrology, but there's a very strong tradition of uh, extended immigration from the Arab world into South Asia, into all parts of South Asia. And then there is also this uh, very uh, established history of development that would not have been possible. Western astrology, as we know it today, uh, as a psychological tool, uh, as a tool of empowerment, these ideas actually come from the Arab world. So I wanted to ask you, when you say you, you do Western astrology, what do you feel is like the defining hallmark that makes astrology Western? Well, that's a really good question. I knew I was going to get really great questions from you. <laughs> um, there's a few things that come to mind with this. Um, astrology is a living practice, and it always um, evolves, and it becomes what it is a culture needs it to be. There was a time not so long ago in South Asia uh, where you didn't have what you have now, which is a rising middle class. And you think about what it means to be middle class. It means that you believe that based on your own effort, you can improve your circumstances. You can create more and you can create a situation so that your children will have more. It involves some measure of self-determination to be a person in the middle class. And this has changed the astrology. 
in India, it has changed Vedic astrology as well, whereas before it was very much about the calculations, okay? This is the age you're going to get married. Uh, this is the age you're going to have children. These are what, your, what gender your children are going to be, what ages you're going to be. It has now um, started to evolve in very powerful ways. We are seeing this where people are now asking of astrologers, like, what can I do, right? How is it that I can uh, make myself more available to marriage and, and things like that? And this arises from this idea of the rise of middle class, in my humble opinion. Now you look at Western astrology, and I think part of the difference is um, the tropical zodiac and the sidereal zodiac. Now I know it's not that simple because there are a lot of Western astrologers who use sidereal as well. Um, however, the simple way that I can explain the difference, although I suspect your audience is quite sophisticated anyways, they would already know, but the simple way that I can explain the difference is that Vedic astrology calculates the positions of the planets based on their relationship to the fixed stars. So based on what they are already doing out there. Whereas the tropical zodiac, or what has also been called the Western zodiac, is based on our perception of the sky. It's the relationship that the planets are having to us, to the earth. And I think that this uh, sets up a certain... Uh, unconscious philosophical assertion. And so the philosophical assertion is in Western astrology that you are the center of the universe. Your experience matters, right? Uh, the world revolves around you. And I think that that is part of the Western experience, actually. And this is what has allowed us to be where we are today, where people are, uh, it's the individual who is the nucleus of society. It is the individual who is expected to take ownership for their life and move their life in the direction that they choose. Um, and, you know, when I was growing up, my parents, they taught me that I could have anything I wanted, I could be anything I wanted, as long as I was willing to work for it. That was the thing that they always told me. And I've, you know, shared before, even in my work, like my uh, parents very much uh, raised me in a way to say to me constantly, you are going to be prime minister of Canada. Like that was their goal for me, but it, it wasn't just some airy thing. They were very serious in this and they uh, trained me. And, and I, I mean, I feel very fortunate in it because they, they taught me to think about the world and think about equality and, and things like that. Now that idea that, you know, a, a child of immigrants uh, could become the prime minister of Canada uh, this is a very, this is about Western values, I do believe, again, in my humble uh, opinion. Uh, because Eastern culture has uh, uh, this sense of the nucleus being the family. And so it's so much about what your family has done that you either build on or you continue that tradition. And so when I think of why I'm a Western astrologer, a few different things come to mind. But the main thing is that for me personally, I think of the way that Western astrology and the psychological tradition is so interwoven. And for me, what really drew me to astrology, what made it come alive for me when I really needed it to, what made me commit to this journey was that psychological perception. It was that exploration of what's really going on in my life. What am I really feeling? What is the lesson, right? That idea, what is the lesson? That has a huge uh, Western philosophical uh, assertion to it. And so I think that that is, is part of why I consider myself a Western astrologer. Okay, cool. Now, I also wanted to ask you, how did that happen? How did you get into astrology and how did it become not just an interest, but like a profession? Well, like I said, there are a lot of stories about different people in my family who practiced various forms of esoteric arts, including astrology. And I know that uh, growing up, it wasn't that in my immediate family, the people around me were astrologers, but my aunts in particular, the women in my family on both sides, were huge fans of going to astrologers and psychics and getting readings. Like this was very much a thing that people did. And I was a very intuitive child. I was encouraged to develop and hone in on that intuition. So there was that support for that as well. But I would think the defining thing that happened for me 
was that when I was 14 years old, what we used to have uh, back in Toronto, well, we still have this, because um, I was born and raised in Toronto, and we have this fair that happens the last three weeks of summer every year. It's called the Canadian National Exhibition, CNE. And I remember what used to happen is they would have like, you would go, there would be a job day and you would go and there'd be all these cards up on a board. And basically you would look at the cards and you would pick cards and then you'd go walk up to a table. The card would tell you and you'd basically like just interview right there on the spot. And normally you got hired pretty instantly to uh, get, you know, a job for those three weeks. And so I remember going and I just went up. I didn't know what I was going for. And like literally, they barely spoke to me. They hired me on the spot. And then they gave me a sheet of paper and it had a hand on it and it had all these arrows on it. And it said, if this line goes up, it's a creative person. If this line goes down, it means this. And so basically they, they said, learn this and come back tomorrow. And the next day I was doing palm readings, like 25, 50, 75 a day. I think the one day where I really did the most when I just did over a hundred palms in that one day. And yeah, so I was working like, you know, 12 hours, eight hours a day and just reading palms back to back. And people would constantly tell me, you're good at this. You're good at this, right? They were just always telling me this. And so palm reading, yes, there's definitely a tradition in my family of palm reading as well. But then after that was uh, over, what after age was that, that? My 14 years old. So that was a while ago, but like I started as a pro, like right mm. out the gate. And then people started giving me family members, my mom, my aunt started giving me astrology books and saying, Hey, you're going to be good at this. I have a feeling you're going to be good at this. And I decided to pursue astrology for a few reasons. One was it, it just resonated with me, like this idea that as above, so within, right? Like what's happening in the stars connects to my heart. I just love that idea. But the other part of it was when people found out that I read palms, like whenever I'd be out, they just put their hand in my face right away. And I didn't want that. I was like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want like everywhere I go, people are like, here, read my hand, read my hand. So that was a part of it as well. Like, I guess now when I look at it, it's like, okay, that didn't feel like the path for me. It might be for others, but for me, it was definitely astrology. And then I remember being 19 and my aunt, um, my aunt Shireen, she basically put a tarot deck in my hand and said, Hey, I think you're going to be good at this. And that night I was doing readings for her friends and she was an esthetician. And so she had clients coming to her home. She had like a little setup and I would be reading her clients as well. Like they'd be getting their, you know, eyebrows waxed and I'd be like doing tarot readings for them and things. And then a few years later, well, not a few years later, I remember a little after that I was working at Walmart and uh, this was before university, I was working at Walmart. And I remember everybody sort of found out that I do astrology and I was doing astrology sort of behind the cash register, right? When we'd had a few moments. And then it was after that, that people started offering to pay me. That was when I was in university and I was working at a call center. People started saying, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks. Oh, you know, like that, like I'll, if you do my reading, if you do my cards, if you look at my chart. And then it just really grew from there. It really did. And um, I went full-time into astrology some 12 years ago, over 12 years ago. I've been full-time astrologer now. And it's an amazing, it's so perfect for me. Like when I think about it, it's just like, wow, I could not have written it better. Like this is so the life that I really want. You know, like we say we want a lot of things. And I know how when I was young, when I was growing up, there were a lot of things I wanted, but it didn't come from that genuine place, right? It came from a place of needing to prove something or my own wounds and needing to, to show the world something about myself. But the truth is that the value that matters to me more than anything else in the world is my freedom. And astrology has given that to me in profound ways. And what matters to me is doing work that I find meaningful, that I feel taps into my own vision and being part of a, a voice in the world that affirms a loving voice in the world and being a, a representative of that, if you will, a steward of love and wisdom, as I like to say. And so, yeah, I get to do all that. And I, I just think it could not have been written any better. Like, that's how amazing my life is. Yeah. So this is my next question then. Yes. You love doing what you're doing. 
Yes. What do you love the most? Like, which kind of readings do you, when you get them, your eyes light up, like, this is going to be a good one. I love this stuff. Uh, wow, that's a really good, good. Uh, you know what I really love? I have, I, we were talking just before you pressed record, we were talking about the Sag energy. So I have a Sagittarius moon. Um, I have a grand trine in air as well. Uh, a sun, Mars, uh, Pluto, grand trine in air. And um, honestly, to me, it's like the teaching. I love the teaching. Like, it's so exciting to me, um, especially in person. Like when I get to travel to a location and I get to meet people in person and I get to give them a hug and uh, I get to sign my books for them and I teach them something and I get to make it about more than astrology, right? Because to me, astrology is a vehicle. Like really, that's what it comes down to. It is a vehicle that I use to affirm love and wisdom in the world. It's a vehicle that I use to remind myself that whatever's happening in my own life, it is part of some larger spiritual lesson. And it is a vehicle to, to give people hope, really, at the end of the day. I only very recently started sharing, like last year, when I was a teenager, I went through a horrible depression, just an awful depression uh, for a few years. Lots of Saturn was happening in my chart in a brutal way uh, at the time. And I remember how like, just having to go out was like a huge deal. And I remember how like when I would go out and I would be like at the bus stop and someone would say hi, or I'd get on a bus and the bus driver would nod his head and say hi, that was enough to keep me going for that day. Like that, that kindness would be enough. And I think about how there are people out there who really struggle, you know, and are going through tough times. And I feel like I really want to give them hope. I want to remind them that whatever it is that they're going through, it is part of something bigger and that it will pass, you know, and that they can use whatever is happening now to in some way be better. And I've been on YouTube so long now, over 10 years, my own audience has seen me go on a journey. They've seen me when I have had times where things weren't great for me. They've seen me when I've looked worried. They've seen me with health issues and all that kind of stuff. They've seen me evolve and grow. And it's not just that they've seen me, but in their own way, they've been there for me. And I hope that I've been there for them too. And that has been something that keeps me going as well, that you know what, I got to make this video. There's somebody out there who's going to need this video. I can't let them down. I got to make this video. And so no matter what I'm feeling, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what my learning, I have learned that I can put it aside and still be useful to somebody else. And that that usefulness could be that voice that a person needs for just one more day. And that means everything to me. Like that really is, I think, number one. Mm. And then the second, close second would be the in-person, you know, the classes that I teach, because we have so much fun in person when I teach classes. Uh, it's just a riot and it's just so much fun and, and seeing faces light up and seeing that these are real people. These aren't comments on the internet. These are real people who are there uh, watching, who've been watching, you know? It, it reminds me of what a, a sacred blessing it is to be able to in some way have some small part of someone's sacred journey to have that is such a huge blessing. So I think those are the, the top two. Okay. And then there's, uh, you find joy in so much, right? Yeah, but let me ask you the opposite one because I'm Mr. Yeah. Saturn. <laughs> so, what do you think is like when you, what kind of readings or situations that you're called upon to serve in, do you feel like, oh no, I don't know. Can I really... This is difficult. What kind of astrology or situations or readings are difficult for you? Hmm. I think that when it's very consequential, you know, and I think that when I see that someone really is going through huge transits and they're just going to be one after the other after the other, and it doesn't look like it's going to let up for a while. I think it's the disappointing, the fear of disappointing people, to be honest and trying to find something good, even when the chart looks so difficult. I mean, I think that that was really the thing earlier in my practice. I've since learned, and I think part of learning is learning about the new techniques and things like that. You always want to give people hope, you know, but then at the same time, it's hard when someone wants a particular answer 
and you're not seeing it, you know, it's just not showing up in the chart. And that's, that's uh, hard as well, because it is that sense of disappointing somebody. Um, I remember a couple of things come to mind. One is one very light uh, way. I had somebody uh, who I looked at their chart. Uh, they were a fan, they were visiting Cancun. They said, hey, can I meet you? I said, of course. So I, I met them for uh, some, some lattes and dessert. It was lovely. And I do that sometimes if people do reach out. And uh, I remember I was looking at her chart and I was telling her like, look, I was just seeing all this internet, social media energy in her chart that I said, no, you, got, you have to start giving yourself an online presence. You have to in some way. And I mean, it was just one after the other. She didn't want to do it, <laughs> right? It was just like, but this, and I feel vulnerable. And I don't want to, and I, I really want to do this and that. And so I was trying to tell her like, look, there are ways that you can do it and feel safe because it was really rooted in this idea of being vulnerable. And I said, look, it doesn't have to be you. You know, like when I'm in my videos, when I'm doing my videos, it's one part of me. It's an authentic part of me, but it's one part of me. I recently shared something online about, you know, when you're spiritual, but you still like to turn it up and you see this girl and she's staging and everything. And there's this, uh, you know, very uh, dance uh, hip hop music in the background, but she's also dancing, you know, she's enjoying herself. She's dancing and she's saging. And that is what I think it means to be a complete human being. You know, I have a, a speaking engagement coming up in Las Vegas. I am so excited about this. I think it's going to be so much fun. However, I'm not only going to be there for a speaking engagement. I'm not coming in for a few hours. I am going to enjoy Las Vegas while I am there. I'm going to fully enjoy Las Vegas. And well, I don't know about fully, but yes, I will find my way to make Las Vegas what I need it to be. But Las Vegas is not, you know, one of those places where they are necessarily burning sage on the strip. Maybe they are, right, on the Las Vegas strip. But, um, you know, I think that it's, you know, that balance is part of it as well, you know. But, um, yeah, I think that's one part of it. Another part of it, I remember once, and I've learned to be honest with people about what I see. But, you know, I remember once I had somebody and she hadn't been in a relationship in a really long time. And she asked me about, you know, when she was going to find a relationship. And, you know, I looked at the chart and there was just no indication of, you know, I was really pulling out the techniques here. Like I was <laughs> really trying to, I mean, I've heard it said that if for something to actually manifest, you should ideally be able to see uh, two or three uh, indications that this is going to happen. So for example, for relationship, there are a lot of things in the chart that can indicate a relationship. However, um, ideally, you're not just resting on one because I've done that in my early years in my practice. I did that. I saw one thing and I said, oh, you're going to meet somebody. And then the person wouldn't meet anybody. And then I learned, well, wait a minute, what else was happening in the chart, right? Because they could have something that is saying, yes, a person could come, but they could also have something else that is saying, you know, this person is just uh, not ready or they're going to be distracted or there's going to be a lot of work. They're not going to have time. Um, and so it's about learning to balance and trying to verify what it is that you see. You know, it's called a judgment when you're making a judgment. But anyways, this woman, uh, she wanted to know and it, there was just, I was pulling out so many techniques and I just could not see anything. Now, maybe that was part of the divine plan for her to change something within herself to make herself available to love. Um, or maybe it, you know, was that I'm a human being and I'm flawed and maybe there was something else that I didn't see because we have to approach it with humility. We have to approach the chart with humility, but also trust the moment, trust the divination, right? You have to trust that what comes forward is what's meant to come forward in that moment. So uh, there's all these factors, but then I just hated to disappoint her. Like it felt so sad to disappoint her, you know? Um, so I think that was the other, that's the thing that tends to be hard, but I have learned to honor the symbols and to just trust that it'll be what it needs to be. I, I had an amazing conversation with a young lady and she said how she was at a job and she hated this job. And she went to see a psychic and she was with a, a person she didn't like, uh, she was in a horrible relationship. She was in a horrible job. She went to a psychic and the psychic said, he's the best you're ever going to get. Uh, don't break up with him. And she said, uh, there's not going to be any other jobs for you for a long time. Uh, don't leave your job. 
find a way to get along. And that girl, she must have had a lot of Uranus energy in her chart because she got so mad. She got so rebellious that she said within three days, she changed her whole life. She quit her job. She broke up with the guy. She moved out of their place and, and she made all these huge changes. And now like within three months, she was at a job she loved. She's meeting new people. And so her life was just dramatically changed. And I said to her, you know, how do you know that that wasn't exactly what you were meant to hear? You know, how do you know if she had said to you, um, yes, quit that job and leave that guy, you'll be fine in three months. You might have left being like, oh, I don't know, like, yeah, she thinks I could, maybe I could. But this way, it tapped into a different spirit within her. And she went, no way, I am doing this. And she did it. And it led her to that. So to me, that's very much about trusting the moment. So I hope that that, uh, that I'm thinking about this woman, as I said, where I didn't see any indications. My hope is that um, she took whatever she needed out of that reading and out of that moment. And, and it led her to whatever she needs next. Mm. Okay. I, can, I think that to keep our interview within, within like an hour, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the like philosophical questions that I have for you. All righty. All right. So okay. let me see what the first one is on my docket. Right. Right. So I want to ask you if you have any particular philosophical or religious background that you sort of think of yourself as I'm a member of such and such. No, I don't actually. I really believe in, I remember when I was a little girl, I asked my mom, how do we know which religion is right? And she said, we don't know. We can't know. Um, and I remember that being taught at a very young age as a child that I was part of everything and that I could take part in everything. And so, you know, I remember one year I said to my parents, I want a Christmas tree. And we got a Christmas tree and it was awesome. And I remember as a child, of course, growing up, there was a very small South Asian community. And so everybody kind of knew each other. Now Toronto is like 25% South Asian. If you just start talking to somebody because they're South Asian, it's not going to go well, probably, <laughs> you know, but back then you really stopped and talked to anybody who was South Asian, at least my parents did. And I remember in the South Asian community, there are three major religions. There is a, a Christian minority, yes, but it's mostly um, Hindu, Sikh and Muslim. And when I was growing up, I went to religious ceremonies and events for all of those religions regularly. And I went to a school that was a very uh, an immigrant neighborhood in an immigrant neighborhood. There were a lot of uh, Greek Orthodox, especially. Um, and I remember as a child participating in different Christian uh, festivities as well, singing Christmas carols and things. And I think that that sort of set the foundation for me to be open to whatever it is and wherever it is, I find wisdom and solace and inspiration. And it also opened me to see myself more in all kinds of people. And so I'll give you an example. It was a year, a year and a half ago, I think now, that I went to um, Asia. And it was a huge, like, life transforming trip for me. And I spent a lot of time in Thailand, especially. And I love Thailand because of the temples and the Buddhism, like that really does uh, reach uh, something within me. It reminds me of some essential truths. And I went there and like every day I went to different temples and I would sit there and I would, you know, read different texts like Buddhist texts and things. And I would uh, meditate on them while I was at these different temples. My experience was maybe different than other tourists there, but it was incredibly meaningful to me. I mean, that really was a life changing time for me. Um, I was still making videos on YouTube. I was still doing everything kind of externally, but within me, I was, and always, I mean, we're always on a spiritual journey, but that was very powerful. So that is the most recent thing that's resonated with me very strongly. Um, but yeah, like I'll go through these phases where I want to learn more about a particular tradition or I'll come across something and I'll get something out of it. But I think, you know, like I said before, we are older souls than ever before. We are older souls. And I feel like, honestly, somebody, again, somebody online said, what have you been in a past life? And I said, I really believe I've been everything. Like, I really believe that we are older souls. We've really been everything. Sometimes you do meet people who are obviously like a more younger soul. But um, 
you know, I, I have found ways to see myself in people where it's the last person <laughs> you would expect me to see myself in. And I think that that empathy is part of uh, what helps us to connect with people and, and have compassion. I think empathy and compassion kind of go together. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this. What do you think is the uh, connection or is there some kind of connection between astrology and religion? Well, up until very recently, um, they were not a separate thing. It was the discovery of Uranus that sort of launched uh, this idea, this separation of matter and spirit. And astrology, up until that point, was uh, practiced by uh, religious people, the priests. And to this day, in the Eastern world, it is the priests that still study this. When I was traveling through Asia, I had the privilege of going to a couple of uh, notable uh, Chinese temples. And, you know, I was very surprised. I hadn't known before that there's this whole religion this whole Chinese, ancient Chinese religion that is still practiced by so many people. Um, and so it's amazing how limited my perception was before I went there. But one thing that was really profound to me there was what people were doing was they had, uh, they were making offerings, they were burning incense and they would say a prayer and then they were doing I Ching. So they were like, literally they had sticks and they were raising them, they were practicing I Ching. And I thought that that was incredible. And it was the priests who were there, uh, the monks who were there that were guiding people uh, and explaining things or helping people where they needed to. Um, and I just thought that that was uh, in incredible when you consider that this is how it has been. And I know that we think of the I Ching and astrology as a different thing, but I just see it as divination. And so up until very recently, even now, like when you go here in Mexico, um, when you see a pyramid anywhere in the world, you're looking at a temple. That's what pyramids are. They are temples. And what would often happen is that the priests would go up towards the high part and would look at the sky and interpret that and bring back a message for the king or whatever as part of what it meant to be a priest. Like, this is what you did. You divined the will of the gods. You interpreted the sky to understand what was going to happen or what the will, a higher will was going to be, the gods or God or however you understand it. And I think that this idea of the astrologer or the diviner being of an intermediary of the gods is actually something very deep in the collective unconscious. It is something that is still there. And I think this is why when you go get a reading, normally like i've had this experience recently and it was really good for me to have this experience you know when people come to us for a reading we don't always appreciate that they're nervous they're like oh my god what's this person gonna say oh please say something good you know don't tell me something horrible is gonna happen in them there is that part it's because on some level we still feel that the astrologer is the voice of the gods is the interpreter of the gods and i had that, as I said, I had that experience recently where I went for a reading and I felt that and I went, this is really good for me. If nothing else comes from this moment to appreciate what it is that my clients and people who uh, have a reading with me, what they must feel um, and to have compassion for that or to have empathy for that, to know that. Because I've also had people say, I'm f afraid of what you're going to say. Well, that comes from that collective unconscious part of us that still looks at the astrologer as the intermediary of the gods. And so I think that there is a very long tradition. It was the uh, discovery of Uranus that was this uh, sort of, again, another leap in collective consciousness um, where matter and spirit became two separate things. And there have been great things as a result because up until that point, what you saw in the physical was a reflection of what was happening on spiritual levels. And so if you had a child and your child was born deformed with a deformity or a physical challenge, you had people who would go to the top of a mountain and they thought that this said something about the spirit of this child born in this body. And they would give it back to the gods. They would give this child back to the gods. Um, because the child had a deformity. And it's not that everybody did this, but this was something that was practiced. We know this. We have a lot of stories, especially from ancient Greece, where we see things like this documented. 
When you separate spirit from matter, you're able to see the inherent worthiness of uh, a person, um, regardless of what's happening physically, right? So this is where we have like sort of the foundation of equality start to set in, which is why Uranus is a symbol of uh, human rights and equality, among other things. Um, you can't judge somebody as much based on their race or their gender if spirit is separate from matter. So regardless of the matter, the shell that we hold, there is uh, something else, there is mind that can be independent of that, which sets the philosophical foundation, which allows all the gains and equality that we've made in the world as a result. Um, however, a lot of bad things have come as a result of that as well. You have uh, like taking advantage of the environment. Like if it's just stuff, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and animals as well, the, the sort of what's happened with animals and, and how they are farmed now, uh, that comes from that philosophical understanding as well. Like if it's just stuff, we can do whatever we want with it. And I think that astrology in some way like returns us to our sense that that's not the case, that there is an interconnection, right? That there is something there that is more than what I'm seeing in my life than what things look like. There is some spirituality playing out here. And I think that that is part, I mean, that is something that we need. That is something in our modern world. Um, you know, it was Max Weber who called it the iron cage of postmodernism, this idea of alienation. And I think that astrology, um, and this idea actually comes from my former professor, Patrick Curry, this idea that it is astrology that in some way, allows us to rebel against that idea that it's just stuff that you know it's just a material world it brings spirit back into uh matter but also it helps us to feel less alienated we feel less alone because we feel like we're part of the stars and we're part of the moon and we're part of something bigger i think that that's really important that's an important part of it as well mm -hmm. well i have two connected questions now sure so one of them was you said that you mentioned if we separate spirit and matter, then it's not so much an issue of whether you're a gender or whatever. I didn't even hear that, don't worry. Okay, <laughs> but you know what happens. Yeah. So it's the Coke Zero that does it. I'm a oh my God, Coke Zero. Stuff. That's terrible. I, bad oh, for you. I know. So healthy, isn't it? No, it's <laughs> not. It's not healthy at all. I have uh, three planets in my sixth house, Moon, Venus, and Neptune in my sixth house. So I think it shows not only in terms of my work and the spiritualism and the love that I, I care about so much, but also, yeah, my eating habits, my, <laughs> my preferences. I mean, I, I am very much a sugar and processed foods kind of girl. But Since okay. you mentioned your chart, can we tell people? I want to tell people. Uh, a little bit, just a little. Uh, let me just tell yeah. them about that, how opposite we are. Sure. Do you remember that? Yes, You found I out remember. about this, right? Yeah, so yeah. you're ascendant is cancer, right? I'm a... Um, Sorry, my ascendant is Cancer, yes. Yeah, and I'm Capricorn. Yes. And then your moon is... What degree? 20, what degree? 23? That is conjunct my Mercury. Then nice. This is what astrologers do. For those of you who are uh, new to this, when astrologers <laughs> meet each other, this is exactly what we do. Like, where's your son? What degree? This Aha, is my that's planet. why we like Earth. each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's what I'm thinking, actually. That's why we really compliment each other. Because yeah. our ascendants are opposite, and then our moons are opposite. Yours is Sagittarius, mine's Gemini, and our mm -hmm. suns are also opposite. So you're a Leo, right? Oh, awesome! So we yeah, got so all three. That compliment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I it's really appreciate. So actually, when I'm listening to you talking, I'm really feeling like, wow, I wish I could get in more into that mindset because it's. I appreciate the mindset because it's right opposite for me in the zodiac. I can see it, but. It's not the point of view. My personal subjective experience is so different. It's so much more like work oriented and get this done, get this reading right. And, you know, because it's capricorn -y and all this. You're six, sixth and house, sixth and eighth housey too, like me. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Anyway, let me ask you it about is. this male and female thing. So can I just ask one thing? Yeah. So do you eat healthy? Yeah, I like, do. Do you eat whole healthy foods and stuff? Well, there's another way that we are opposite. Yeah, but not <laughs> because, obsessively. Like I'm not obsessed yeah. with it. But I just, yeah. Because of the fact that I actually, I, what I care more about is like animals. 
Yeah. So I don't yeah. even. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Yeah. Now that I have a dog, I got a dog earlier in 2018, in the spring of 2018, and I never had a dog before. When I was, uh, many years ago, we had a cat, but it was very much my father's cat, basically, my parents' cat, um, who I loved very much, Biggie. And he lived a full life with them. Uh, Billy, who was his name. Now my dog is Biggie. Some Biggie's things are different. Name. Biggie Smalls, yeah. And <laughs> uh, yeah, and so Biggie has just, I mean, he's changed me in so many ways, so many ways. I mean, I just never anticipated uh, the love that I could feel, the dedication, I, like the tiger mom in me wakes up with him. Nice. Uh, but also to see, this might sound strange to some people, but I see humanity in him. You know, I see like the best that we can be in him, in the love and the dedication. I mean, it, it hurts my heart to see how loving he is. Um, and it's a very powerful insight into the inner child that we all have. I feel like they embody our inner child for us to help us to heal that inner child. Mm. And so, yeah, so when you talk about animals, um, I feel like I'm on a journey with that, uh, mm. thanks to Biggie. Yeah. Okay, so I, I have to wrap it up because I have an, another point. Okay, but, sure. But I want to wrap it up with one qu the last question, like a question I want to finale on. So. Okay. What do you think then is the purpose of life? Let's say like, why should we strive? What are we striving for? What's the goal? Why should we wake up? What should, you know? I love that you asked this. Um, I will tell you when I was in graduate school, I came across like when I started graduate school, you know, when you start, you sort of have to start thinking about what is your thesis going to be, right? Your the like your final paper. It's a big paper. What is it going to be? And I had started off thinking, I want to write about Pluto. I want to explore that whole under, you know, I, I had Pluto conjunct my moon at the time. So of course I want to write about Pluto. Um, but then what happened was, I remember I was in the library and I came across, because one of my professors, again, Patrick Curry, he said to me, think of the library as divination. Like when you're there, you're just meant to be open to whatever wisdom and knowledge is meant to find you. So let it find you as it needs to and know that you're ready for it. It's the perfect time. And, and listen to your intuition as you're guided towards different wisdom. And so I was in the library and I came across this book called Whoso Knoweth Thyself by Ibn Arabi, who was an early, one of the early Sufi mystics. Um, and I remember it was a little book, little essay, and I sat there on a stool in the stacks, as they call it, in the middle of all the books. And uh, I read this book cover to cover, it was a small essay. And I had an experience when I read this book. It was, it was almost as if all, everything I went to, through just to be there at the program, just to be that year in England, it was for that moment, it felt like that. And basically the, the complete idea is whoso knoweth uh, thyself knoweth thy Lord. And what that means is to know yourself is to know the creator. And which is the idea that a lot of Sufism is, is based on. It's this idea that in order to know the creator, you have to create, which is why arts are a very big deal in different Sufi traditions. Um, but Ibn Arabi is most known for what he calls the magnificent breath. And so I ended up, just a little side note, I ended up writing my whole thesis on his work. And you can actually read that on my website. It's called Unity of Being. So the whole thing is there if you want to, you know, if you can tackle the academic writing that I had to do at the time uh, and make your way through it. Because it can be a little bit, um, you know, it can, it can change the energy if you're not used to it, right? It, it becomes so intellectual. But hopefully, you know, people will be able to access that with heart. But it's there. And anyway, so uh, I ended up doing that. So I feel kind of like I have this uh, agreement with his soul that whenever I get an opportunity to talk about him, I will talk about him because he really did shape who I am today as an astrologer in uh, so many different ways. I will always be very grateful to his soul for that and his work for that. Uh, our work makes us immortal. I do believe that. Uh, these videos, this interview that you're doing, it'll be in the world really forever, as long as there's human history, there can be this, this interview and somebody 100 years from now, 200 years from now, could come across this interview 
and be changed in some way. It could be exactly the message that they need in that moment. But anyways, his idea about the magnificent breath is this, that he said, every longing, every ache, every yearning, every joy, every elation that your heart feels is another way that God experiences itself in a way that it would not have had you not be there to experience that exact uh, emotion, that exact elation, that sorrow, that joy. And I was so moved by this because the idea of the magnificent breath is that God isn't this static thing, right? It's essentially an energy that is growing, that is expanding, and it is through us that this energy gets to expand. That is the breath, the magnificent breath that keeps growing more and more. And I call it love and wisdom. That's what I like to call it because I care a lot about inclusive language, first of all, and because I am an inclusive person. That's how I conceptualized it. He was saying in his writing, God, but I understood that he was talking about something that is beyond our intellectual or written concepts of a, a higher being. He was talking about an energy, again, that I call love and wisdom. And I believe that we are here to be part of that magnificent breath. We are here to expand the energy of love and wisdom in our own life. And we don't always appreciate it when we're in the middle of our own emotions or getting caught up in a particular moment, that that moment is sacred. You know, when you think about the ancient Greeks, you know, they appreciated this idea that all of life is sacred. When they walked along in the world and they felt a strong emotion, they said, oh my God, this is a strong emotion. This must be a God. And so they had gods for everything that you could feel, everything that you ex could experience had a different God. And in this way, it was a reminder that all of our human experience is sacred. And so I feel like the reason that we are here and the reason that all of us are actually here, regardless of how it seems on the surface, regardless of how much people hide it behind pain and anger uh, or whatever, ultimately we are all here to move ourselves towards greater love and greater wisdom, to be part of that magnificent breath, part of the expansion of the energy of love and wisdom in the world. Um, that I do believe is the meaning of life, but we find it in our everyday experience. It is the everyday experience that helps us to embody God um, in a way that God would not have been able to had we not experienced that emotion. I love it. Did you have fun? Did you relax? Yes, I'm relaxed now. I you think didn't I have to enough. use your fan at all. <laughs> no, I didn't. I started out with this fan. I was coming here, hi Vic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was I like thinking, God, that's a beautiful fan. Is that Mexican? <laughs> Thank you. I think I bought it in Mexico, but it might have been from the Chinese store. Uh, yeah, because I have really been getting into feng shui a lot and learning a lot about ancient Chinese mysticism. It's just really been calling me very strongly lately. So I'm on a journey with that. Not ready to necessarily put it out in the world or make videos about it just yet, but I feel very much on a journey with that. And uh, so yes, I, I've been going to the, there's one Chinese store in the, all of Cancun. And I've been there probably more than, than most people. Um, and I discovered a few new ones in Mexico City. So before I go to Vegas, I'm going to Mexico City as well. But yes, it's Mexican. I think the Mexican design is a little bit different. It's more embroidered. Uh. Um, I don't have it necessarily available at the moment, but it's more embroidered. But a lot of what you see here, it has to do with the, the different Chinese uh, mythologies. That's great. Thank I need you. to hang out with you more because your everything yes. is opposite from mine. So you got everything. Uh, you know what I mean? I need to yeah. get Nadia Shah rubbed your off. Your background is so beautiful. The Thank background you. there's like is that like sculpture and things? It looks yeah, incredible, a, like wood. Carved, wood, carved wood. Oh, it's incredible. And so you live in India. I know no, that you said you want to no, wrap no. it up. Oh, I wish I live in Japan. Oh, that's incredible. It's close, closer to India than America, but it's not quite India. India is a little bit too dangerous to live in. Right now, yeah? yeah. Oh, I hope it No, it's just better. like I have three yeah. kids. Uh, yeah. And I, Japan is entirely safe. Yes. Very that organized, law-abiding, yes. safe. And India is very lawless and wild. So I wouldn't uh, really want to take three kids to India to raise them. If I was all by myself, then I would probably would have wound up living in India.
Yeah. But I'm close enough. But here. I know a lot of people have lived in Japan for an extended period of time. People in my family yeah. uh, have lived in Japan. Uh, I have a cousin who uh, went there to teach English and he ended up marrying someone in, in Japan. And now he has children. He's been there for like 20 years now. So a lot of people love it for a lot of reasons. But I think that wherever you go, it's like there you are, right? And so wherever you go, it's like whatever you bring to it, you'll get out of it. And Japan has so much of all of it. It has a lot of capitalism. It has a lot of technology. Uh, but it also has a lot of spirituality. It has this very rich tradition of beauty and simplicity and uh, understanding the essential nature of all things. And so it's a, it's a profound place for sure. But so they when you come and visit, together. when are you going to come visit? Yeah, I should come and visit soon. Yeah. I sh I've, I've been invited to speak at an astrology group in China. Right now, you may not know this, but right now, China and Canada are having some very interesting back and forth. So when it calms down a little bit, I will plan uh, an Asian trip. I promised my father I would take him to Egypt. Uh, and so I'm hoping that that comes about this year, late this year. Mm. And if that does, then I'll shoot over to Asia. And yes, we can do something in person. That would be yeah, amazing. Yeah, that'd be great. I can, I can see that carving in person. That would be okay, awesome. Okay, awesome. You'll yeah. laugh when you see it in person. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, so much. Thank you everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.